Ulysses S. Grant was a family man, a dedicated citizen, a military and presidential hero. He loved horses and smoked cigars, but most importantly, he was, from the very beginning, a common man, an essential American. His story of adversity and success remains one of the most inspirational biographies our nation's history has to offer and deserves to be told with the passion and authentic demeanor of Sam Grant as General Ulysses S. Grant. A highly acclaimed academic and motivational speaker, film producer, and United States Navy veteran, Sam has dedicated the last 20 years of his life to understanding, portraying, and honoring Ulysses S. Grant. His inspiring and informative visits are entirely first person, and all audiences that have engaged him in the past have left with the overwhelming feeling that they have experienced the true General Grant up close and personal, as history should be. General Grant will be introduced by his loving and devoted wife, Mrs. Ulysses S. Grant. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my greatest pleasure to introduce to you this evening your general, your president, your hero. Although he will be very angry with me for introducing him as such. For an evening in his honor strikes the greatest fear in his heart. You see, my husband is not gifted in the ways of public speaking. But he is a good soldier, and he will rise to the occasion as best he can. For it is his duty this evening to share with you his experience in the Civil War and to honor the soldiers and sailors who fought at his side the women who supported them, and the land and the union for which they fought for long and bloody years. But who was this man who brought an end to such a devastating and horrendous war and healed the wounds of the North and South with a wisdom and a kindness and a foresight unknown and leaders of this age or any other. Well, in the words of William Tecumseh Sherman, our dear friend and ally, he says, Grant is a mystery to me, and I believe he is a mystery unto himself. My husband is the most unlikely of military heroes. He was born in Point Pleasant, Ohio, where he was having a typical frontier boyhood raised among horses. And the foul smells of his father's tannery business always disgusted him, which is why I find it terribly, terribly upsetting to hear the newspapers of our day and age calling him a butcher. There is no other leader in history who cares more about the men who are dying in his army than our general, Ulysses S. Grant. But he was not a political person, but he did know how to win battles, and he was a master strategist. In fact, our dear President Lincoln once said of Grant, I cannot spare this man, he fights, and truer words were never spoken. He was educated at West Point and served bravely in the Mexican War. And upon return, we were married near my family home in St. Louis, Missouri. But shortly thereafter, Liss was transferred to garrison outposts on the West Coast, and we missed each other very terribly. So he did resign from the Army and came home to start a civilian life with us. We tried farming. We tried business life. And then, war came again to our country's shores. In March of 1864, towards the end of the terrible Civil War, President Lincoln called my husband to Washington City and made him commander of all the federal armies. And as you may know, on April 9th, 1865, General Ulysses S. Grant, in his most moment of history 
truly brought to fruition the signing of the terms of surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. Truly a great moment and welcomed our Southern soldiers back as countrymen again. In the words of our contemporaries, and I shall quote from them this evening, the general was once described as, and I quote, brave as any man should be, he is not a brilliant man, but he is a good and brave soldier, sober, tried for years, industrious, and as kind as a child, which is another reason why it deeply concerns me that anyone would remember General Grant as a drunk with a penchant for whiskey. Historical evidence will show that rumors of my husband's alcoholism were simply cooked up by his political enemies at the time. How could someone succeed in so many battles and have that kind of a problem? And in a most endearing manner, I do digress, another newspaper described him as an ordinary, scrubby-looking man with no gait, no station, and no flashy manner. In fact, once a British correspondent once said of Ulysses, and I quote, I never met a man with so much simplicity, shyness, and decision. He is a soldier to the core, a genuine commoner, a commander of a democratic army of a democratic people. No more afraid to command a million men than a small company. And I will leave you with this parting description of my husband, and I quote, General Grant was calmer than Sherman by a hundredfold. The habitual expression on his face was so quiet as to be almost incomprehensible. In utterance, he was slow and sometimes embarrassed. But his words were well chosen, never leaving the remotest doubt of what he intended to convey. Not a sign about him suggested rank or power. But in battle, the Sphinx awoke. Ladies and gentlemen, General Ulysses S. Grant. Gentlemen, ladies, being entirely unaccustomed to public speaking and without the desire to cultivate the power, it is impossible for me to find proper language to thank you for your attendance here. All I can say is that to whatever I may be called by your will, I shall endeavor to discharge its duty with fidelity and honesty of purpose. Of my rectitude in the performance of public duty, you will have to judge for yourself by the record before you. I have been quite fortunate in my long life, being blessed by a fine wife for so many years, a loving family. I was blessed that our late president, Mr. Lincoln, saw fit to give me the responsibilities of bringing the rebellion to a final and successful conclusion. On the 26th of February, 1864, the bill restoring the grade of Lieutenant General of the Armies had passed through Congress and become law. My nomination was sent to the Senate on the 1st of March. And the next day, the 2nd, I was confirmed. On the 9th of March, the commission was handed to me at the executive mansion by President Lincoln in the presence of his cabinet, my eldest son, Fred, those of my staff who were with me in Washington, and a few other guests. On the following day, March 10th, 
1864. I set my headquarters at Culpeper Courthouse in Virginia, determined to find a means to bring the war to a just and honorable close. It took another 13 months, almost to the day, to complete that task. And on the 9th of April, 1865, early in the afternoon, General Robert E. Lee surrendered his Army of Northern Virginia. There was still General Johnston's ragtag army confronting General Sherman in North Carolina and a number of garrisons throughout the South. But Lee's surrender, acceptance of the terms, effectively ended the war. I have been asked on a number of occasions why the war lasted so long, was so hard and so bloody. For myself, I believe it is simply that this war was fought here in America, Americans against Americans. And Americans do not back down from a fight. In this war, the soldiers and sailors who fought it were fighting for the same ideas, the same causes for which their fathers and grandfathers before them had fought. In early 1868, General Sherman, on learning the, the dilemma I faced when I had been asked if I would allow my name to be placed in nomination for the presidency of the United States. He wrote me regarding his great concern that I should be drawn into the political intrigues of Washington. I had returned a letter to my good friend, my mutual concerns regarding the same subject. But, while I did, I said to him that I had the same concerns and was thankful of his sentiments. However, I also knew quite clearly that if I did not accept the nomination and we were to allow a politician to run for that office, we might well lose all we had fought four long, hard years to gain. For that reason, while I did not wish the office of the presidency of this great country, I felt it my duty to accept the nomination. And I am very proud that you, the people of this country, saw fit to honor me with eight years, two full terms, as your president. I feel very much embarrassed in being here before you to say anything in response to the undeserved eulogy which I have just had to hear. However, we have also heard recently some words of little eulogistic of our own country of our own institutions, of the people who fill the country and make those institutions, a great minority of whom I had the privilege to fight alongside during the late war. And to this, I may say a few words. As you are all un, um, undoubtedly aware, I have had the last few years an opportunity to visit most of the civilized nations of this earth. I have had the last and had a very fair opportunity of comparing their governments, their peoples, and their institutions with ours. 
And I can assure one and all of you that I came back to America better than I went away, I hope. We are blessed with a soil of a, and a variety of climate that no other one nation is blessed of. Our people are made up, I hope, of the best elements of all the countries, mixed up together in a very happy degree to produce about the best results. We are a nation that proceeds on the theory that power is with the people. Our rulers, only servants, having only such power as the people choose to extend to them from time to time. Other nations, I think history will bear me out in saying, have proceeded on the theory that the power is with the head of the government and that the people have no rights, no privileges, except that as they are extended from the crown. We started out with the experience of those other nations and commenced pretty well, considering that apprentices had to boss the job. Now we have grown to manhood, have become of age, have got a history. I think that we, some way or other, will work through any future difficulties that may ever arise, and that we will go down to the end of time an example to those people and furnish a good example which many of them will feel sooner or later. I shall say but little more except to say I am very much obliged, ladies and gentlemen, for your reception here tonight. Thank you.